So this is the second lecture on uh, the philosophy of science of Thomas Kuhn. Um, and today we're going to talk about the most influential and famous part of Kuhn's philosophy uh, that in many ways reflected the revolution in how science was viewed in the 20th century that's sometimes called postmodernism. Uh, we saw last time that in normal science, science works the way it was envisioned in the scientific revolution, making steady progress according to fixed rules, uh, because science could accumulate puzzles solved uh, even when predictions didn't happen to meet the, uh, or experiments didn't happen to meet the prediction uh, that was made by the hypothesis. Um, instead of rejecting that hypothesis or rejecting the theory, uh, instead we saw that the paradigm would take that failure as a puzzle to be solved and accumulate more and more instances uh, into the theory as things for which we could make correct predictions. Uh, what Kuhn saw is that when theories or paradigms change, uh, it isn't really a matter of proving that the previous paradigm is false, nor is it really a matter of discovering new evidence. Um, instead, there are social forces uh, that cause the change in paradigm. Uh, so we had seen before that uh, science arose as the idea of separating the relative from the absolute, taking us out of the picture. Um, but in this case, uh, science itself, the scientific process, was the picture that we were studying. Uh, and when we studied it carefully, we saw that perhaps it was impossible for us to be completely objective in moving from one theory to another, uh, that there was no place to stand. Um, Rene Descartes, the modern philosopher, had compared the scientific enterprise to Archimedes, uh, who had said if you just give him a, a fulcrum, a lever long enough, he could move the world. Uh, but of course the difficulty was there's no place to stand outside the world even if you had a lever long enough. Uh, so the idea of, of modern science was to find an Archimedean standpoint, a place outside of the world that we're studying, which we could be completely objective in, uh, and which wasn't part of the subject matter studied. Uh, Kuhn's sociological account of science suggests that uh, the scientist is always part of what's studied, uh, always influenced by their paradigm, uh, and they don't have an objective standpoint from which to judge. So uh, paradigm change, or revolutionary science, uh, was often uh, caused uh, by uh, a period of crisis in which there would be confusion and observation and people wouldn't know uh, which of the various different exemplars or paradigms to apply to a particular case. Um, sometimes though, Kuhn said, um, a paradigm change has to occur just as from the death uh, of the old people who had held the previous paradigm and new people who weren't yet trained in the paradigm would then make discoveries or actually affect the paradigm shift or paradigm change. Um, normal science was so conservative in always treating anomalies as problems to be solved um, that oftentimes only young people uh, could make the paradigm shift or change in worldview that was necessary to affect a theory change or a paradigm change and accomplish a scientific revolution. Uh, the difficulty that we're going to be talking about in this lecture uh, is the arguments that Kuhn gave that uh, there was no way of judging whether progress had been made in a paradigm shift or in revolutionary science. Because uh, the meanings, the facts, uh, the uh, paradigms for experimentation and the values that governed a scientific theory were all part of the paradigm, people in different paradigms would often disagree about what the right meanings of terms are, what facts were real and what they which weren't, uh, and which values for scientific inquiry should be uh, applied. Um, so modernism was the view that we studied last week in the scientific revolution, uh, and it was the view that dominated the period called the Enlightenment, when most of the liberal governments uh, of our modern world were formed in the 1800s and the 1700s. Um, they believed that science really could uh, step out of itself and arrive at objectivity, and that the objective truths and methods of science could be a basis for the organization of a society or a culture. Uh, in some ways, uh, Thomas Kuhn's philosophy of science uh, represents the 20th century movement that's been called postmodernism. Uh, 
uh, which says that when we scientifically study our own uh, activities of gaining knowledge, we find that uh, we are not quite as objective as we thought. Uh, when we separate the relative from the ab absolute or the relative from the objective, uh, we may find everything uh, ending up in the relative pile. Um, so we'll see that because Kuhn's theory of the paradigm said all scientific inquiry is part of this system of practices uh, that we call a paradigm, um, there's always going to be some way of stepping out of that paradigm uh, and criticizing it, uh, and there will be no external viewpoint from which you can adjudicate the conflict between those different paradigms, because as we'll see, uh, there are going to be no shared meanings. Words will mean different things in different theories or paradigms. Uh, there'll be no shared facts or perceptions. People in different paradigms will actually see different worlds. Uh, and as we mentioned last time, uh, there will be no shared values. We saw that the rules that determine when an experiment is good, the exemplars for good uh, methodology for a scientific experiment, uh, even the most basic values, like whether what makes a scientific theory good is whether it's beautiful or whether it meets religious uh, requirements or whether it meets some other mathematical or experimental test, are part of the paradigm and different schools of science and different paradigms will uh, have different ideas of what makes something right or wrong. Sometimes there are even different rules of mathematics or different rules of logic uh, that are applied in different paradigms. Uh, we're going to spend most of our time, though, talking about the two other problems uh, that Kuhn brought up, his argument that there are no shared facts uh, or world. Um, so normally we think if there are two theories, well, the theories would make predictions and then we would go to the world and just see uh, which of the predictions was correct most of the time. Um, Kuhn is going to recognize, based upon the work of 18th century philosophers like Immanuel Kant and then later thinkers, as we mentioned before, like Quine uh, and Wittgenstein, uh, is going to argue that our ideas, our concepts, our language affect our perceptions and the world doesn't exist as logical positive thought as a set of atomic already existing facts or perceptions. Uh, the facts and perceptions, the things that we perceive, uh, are in fact formed by our theory. The famous case, of course, is that we only see you know one shade of white or one shade of snow, whereas uh, indigenous uh, Northern American Indians um, would see 25 different shades of white or recognize all the different varieties of snow. So when it snowed, they would literally see different worlds in the same way that uh, a concert pianist, when they hear a piece of music, may hear all of the harmonies and the, uh, the hidden harmonics and the timbers uh, and the structure of the music uh, where we see nothing uh, in the same way that a dog walking through a baseball game uh, we'll miss completely all of the salient realities that we say are happening in the stadium. So let's look at some examples that prove, uh, or that uh, of the type that Kuhn would have used to prove that experiences and facts aren't things that already exist in the world, they're things that are constructed by our mind in accordance with paradigms, and different people in different paradigms might see different worlds. Uh, how many horses do we see? Um, you would think that counting something would be something that was just there, uh, but you can see at first you may not see some of the horses. There are in fact five of them. Uh, so there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. Uh, the ability to pick out the horses from the background, like when we play Where's Waldo uh, as children, um, is something our minds do. Uh, the horses aren't already there in our perception, uh, apart from the activity of our mind. Uh, and the way that our mind uh, 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 perceives that reality can be different in different paradigms. Uh, so you might see this as a tree hiding a bear who's clinging to the tree and whose body we can't see behind the tree. Uh, but you might also see it as four little creepy crawly bugs just crawling along the front of the tree. Uh, those different ways of seeing reality would be informed by different paradigms or different theories. Uh, think of when you're learning to see through a microscope. At first, you don't see anything. Uh, the process of training in a paradigm is training you to see the world a particular way. Uh, here's another simple example. Count the Fs. Again, you might think that it's very simple. 
um, but most students will get this wrong. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven F's there. Did you forget the of's uh, and perhaps the F in scientific? Um, so even the simplest thing uh, will be affected by our expectations and our concepts. Uh, and those expectations and concepts are trained and formed in the training that um, enters you into a paradigm or a disciplinary matrix. How many circles can you see here? It may take you a while. Uh, you probably see the circles here, and most likely you see the circles here. Uh, but maybe you're having a harder time seeing the circles here. Uh, and most likely, uh, you're having a much more difficult time seeing the circles in these boxes. You may have to stare at those for a little while. Uh, so facts aren't there in the world. Our mind and our brain has to actually construct those facts, and how we construct them will be different. Um, so do we see what's unusual in this photograph? Maybe you saw it right away, uh, but maybe you didn't, the dog sitting in the middle of the lecture room. Uh, so here's a ca another case where you, it's hard to pick out the figure from the ground. Do you see the dachshund, the little dog that's uh, sipping water out of a puddle? There's the outline of its back and its legs. Uh, whether you see something or not, whether a fact is there, uh, isn't just a matter of looking. Uh, someone who had the right paradigm would look at that and say, there's a dog there. Someone in a different paradigm might say, what dog? I don't see anything, just as you might not have. Uh, when you look at this figure, do you see the face of Jesus? Or in this one, is the a face of a man in a shadow against a garage? Uh, now you may be able to see, after you look at it a while, you know, the chin, the nose, the eyes, uh, the cheeks, the big full beard. There's his shoulders with sort of a white shawl or cloth across his shoulders. Uh, that process of teaching you to construct that thing in your experience would be what you'd be trained in a paradigm. Someone not trained in a paradigm might never see the face uh, with the chin and the mouth and the nose and the eyes in those shadows. For example, look at this figure. Um, can you see what's there? Many people don't see anything there at all, uh, or see things that you might see like when you look up at the clouds. But this is a photograph of a cow. Uh, there are its nostrils, there's its nose, you can see the line of its snout, there's its eye, there's its eye, there's an ear, there's another ear, there's the outline of its head, and that's the outline of its uh, entire head and snout and nostrils. And there you can see he's behind a fence, um, and that's the his flank, his body, that's obscured by his head. Now, when you didn't see it, there just wasn't a cow there. Uh, it's not as if it was there and you didn't see it. You could look at, you saw everything that was to be there. Your mind, your paradigm, your set of concepts, and the training of your brain had to be trained to construct the data you were getting from your senses uh, into the cow. Uh, and you can imagine people in two different paradigms arguing about whether there was a cow there or not. One person would say, it's obvious, just use your eyes, it's sitting right there, whereas the other paradigm wouldn't. Uh, the two paradigms don't have a shared set of facts. You have to be trained within the paradigm in order to see those facts. Um, you may think that's unrealistic, but these, in fact, there's lots of examples of this in the history of science. Um, these are some of the first diagrams that people took of the planet Saturn through a telescope. Uh, we now know that the rings of Saturn are rings that are in three dimensions floating around the sphere of the planet. Uh, but the first people who drew it didn't see it that way at all. They saw it as various different clouds or various different shaped substances that were orbiting or circling the planet. And it took quite a while to figure out that the weird shapes we were seeing in the telescope uh, were indeed uh, the rings of Saturn. In the 18th century, when people discovered uh, a microscope, one of the first things that they did uh, was to look at very small spells and very small objects to see what was in them. Uh, and one of the things they would look at was sperm uh, to see how reproduction occurred. Uh, at that time, the most dominant paradigm or theory of human reproduction, uh, we had knew nothing about DNA in the 18th century and the 1700s, um, the most dominant theory was called preformationism. It was part of the essentialism theory of Aristotle. Uh, and they held that 
all of the form of a human being was contained in the male sperm uh, and that the female egg was basically nutrition which would allow that tiny form to grow uh, but really all of the essence of a human being was stored in the sperm uh, now you might think that looking under the microscope would abuse them of that notion because now we know that there are no little men preformed inside the sperm uh, but instead uh, when they first describe uh, sperm through the microscopes, uh, they, in fact, thought they saw little men inside the sperm. And here's a drawing of one of the little men who they thought they saw. Uh, and indeed, uh, in um, uh, you know, diagramming some of the parts of those things, uh, they, had, they did these types of drawings as well. So how something appears depends upon the paradigm or the context that you're using to construct that in your mind. So for example, the very same figure, the figure that's marked figure four here, uh, when you see it over here in this corner, you'll see it as um, a bird um, uh, facing to the left. When you see it here in this different context, you'll see it as the head of an antelope facing to the right. Um, in this case, the figure to look at is um, the C. Uh, you can see it as a nose, or you can see it as the letter. In this case, if you look at this figure here, if you look down, you'll see it as a B. If you look across, you'll see it as a 13. This is a very famous figure. It was actually uh, drawn by uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, in his book, Philosophical Investigations, which we'll talk more about. Um, this you can see either as a duck or a rabbit. Yeah, you can see it uh, as a duck facing to the right or a rabbit facing to the left. Here's a little better version of it. You can see it as a duck looking up at the sky or a rabbit munching on the grass. Uh, the claim was that when you m move back and forth between those different views, uh, psychologists would call these perceptual gestalts. A gestalt, G-E-S-T-A-L-T, um, is a perceptual whole. Uh, so you either perceive the whole thing as a duck, uh, and you see this as a bill with a lower jaw and an eye looking up and the belly of the duck, uh, or you see the whole thing uh, as a rabbit, in which case these are ears and that's the little opening of the ear and that's its eye and its little snout munching on the grass. Uh, it's not as if you're seeing basic facts like uh, uh, Euclid would have said in our method of geometrical construction. We have the same basic parts and then we put them together. Or it's not like the logical positives thought that we have basic atomic experiences and then we put them together to make our objects. Even the parts are changed uh, when we perceive it in a different gestalt. Uh, and this is the meaning of the favorite, famous term paradigm shift that Kuhn introduced that's become part of our modern parlance or our modern language. Uh, the paradigm shift is that shifting back and forth from seeing it as the duck or seeing it as the rabbit, that shift back and forth between two incompatible ways of viewing reality or two worldviews. Uh, perhaps you've seen this in one of your um, psychology classes. This figure that you can see is either an old woman or as a young woman. Uh, this figure helps you see it as a young woman. She's looking away from you. You can see her jaw, her ear, her nose, and profile. Uh, this should help you see it as an old woman. There's her chin, there's her lips, her big nose, uh, and her eyes. Um, this was the original figure now that was published in a Victorian magazine. You should be able to see it both ways and have the paradigm shift or gestalt shift. Uh, see it as a young one at first. There's her nose and profile, her eyes looking away. There's her ears. You can make out the folds of her ear. There's her neck with a little choker necklace. Uh, now try to see it as the old woman. Now, there's her chin. There's her thin-lipped mouth. There's her big nose. There's her eyes. You can actually see you know, the glint on the cornea of her eyes. Um, and the wrinkles around her, uh, her eye sockets. The point here is that you're not seeing the same facts in different ways and interpreting them differently, putting them together differently. The parts are actually transformed and you're seeing different, uh, a whole different reality, a whole different world when you have that paradigm shift. Uh, if you weren't convinced with th that you were, were seeing um, two different images instead of just seeing the same thing in different ways, uh, this particular image should convince you. Uh, this is called a Necker cube. Uh, you should find the back of the cube. Maybe it's this, maybe it's this, 
um, find the back square of the cube and stare at that really hard. Uh, if you stare at the back of that cube, it should flip itself inside out and become the front of the cube. And you can continue doing it. Stare at the uh, what become the back of the cube, and it should flip itself out again. Uh, you should be able to flip that cube uh, inside and out uh, to see the different paradigms and keep having the paradigm shift. Uh, you can actually see the image shifting before your very eyes. So obviously, uh, your world is shifting when you have that paradigm shift or gestalt shift. Uh, in this case, you see a three-dimensional cube with a little cube cut out of it. But if you stare at this point, uh, the little uh, cube should pop out and become a smaller cube floating in the air in front of the other cube. Here, you should probably see a dog. If you switch paradigms, uh, you'll probably see it as a cat. There's the paws of the cat. There's its little cat ears. There's its eyes and its nose. It's a much better cat than it is a dog. Note, when you look back here, you can see the body of the cat extending into the distance. Uh, you can see his ears and his forehead. If we go back to the dog, now we can see its mouth opening up, and we see what looks like maybe teeth or a tongue there and his droopy little lips uh, and his ears sticking up in surprise. Um, so again, what we're seeing is the shift of paradigm where either the parts are transformed. Uh, here's another example. Here's a, 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 a sort of a jolly, uh, merry man type guy, uh, and he's got a kerchief on, a three-cornered hat. But if we turn it upside down, uh, you'll see sort of an older man with a, a skinny long nose and chin uh, with his furrowed brow uh, and a cap on. And again, note that the lip here becomes the cap. It doesn't even seem as the same. We transform how we see his forehead uh, to when we're seeing the lip. Here, when we turn this woman upside down, uh, becomes sort of a goat or a monkey type thing uh, with what was the flower hanging down from her hat turned into um, this um, animal. And we can see its nose protruding out, even though the woman's uh, mouth is still present there. So that's the first point we wanted to make, is that there are no shared uh, facts. And that's very closely related to our third point, uh, which is that there are also no shared meanings between paradigms. So we've seen that when two paradigms disagree, we can't perform an experiment and say, let's look and see. So we couldn't test preformationism by saying, let's now that we have a, a microscope, let's look and see um, whether um, sperm literally has little tiny men inside of it um, because when the adherents of that paradigm looked they saw little tiny men and people who weren't in the paradigm didn't uh, so obviously we couldn't determine which paradigm was right by going to the experiences or going to the facts because the facts themselves were formed by experience um, that was part of a, a view that's related to the idea of no shared meaning because as we'll see uh, philosophers in the 19th and 20th century became increasingly convinced that language structures our thought and our experience um, in um, such a thorough way that the linguistic categories that we acquire in acquiring a language affect even uh, how we perceive the world. So the idea that there were no shared meanings behind paradigms is called uh, the incommensurability thesis. You may remember we encountered the word incommensurability before, uh, having no common measure. We saw that the square root of 2 uh, was incommensurable with any unit. No matter how small we made our ruler, it wouldn't fit perfectly. So incommensurability here means that two people in two different paradigms can't understand each other. All of the words have different meanings. So the preformationist uh, and uh, the modern geneticists, when they said sperm, they weren't even meaning the same thing. They were talking past each other uh, because their words had completely different meanings. Uh, we're going to see that this followed from uh, a new theory of meaning um, that was called the network theory of meaning, uh, that the meaning of our terms wasn't determined the way we might have thought by a direct connection with the world, uh, that instead 
the meaning of our term was determined by other terms. So we learn, it's like when you look in the dictionary and the word that you're interested in is defined in terms of other words. And then you have to look up those words in the dictionary. And then you have to look up those words in the dictionary. Um, meanings are relationships essentially between words and between language um, and not between words and the world. So you're not really, as we'll see, uh, you might think that you learned the word dog by seeing a picture of a dog or seeing a dog and then uh, hearing the word dog. They point to it and say dog. Uh, we'll see that what you're really doing there is training someone to see that thing as a dog. You're training them in the paradigm of having that fact and seeing that as a dog. Uh, the meaning of that term is defined by its connection or it's in a network or a mesh of a whole series of different practices uh, and uh, other meanings. All right, we're going to look at two particular arguments um, by philosophers who influence Kuhn uh, that we've mentioned before, Wittgenstein uh, and Willard Van Orman Quine. Um, we're going to look at uh, Wittgenstein's private language argument uh, and Quine's thesis about the indeterminacy of translation. Uh, and those uh, stand behind, or those were the source of Kuhn's incommensurability thesis, his idea that you couldn't compare two paradigms because they were talking about different things. So when Copernicus said the sun was the center of the solar system, and when Aristotle said the earth was the center of the solar system when the Copernican scientific revolution occurred. Kuhn says we couldn't determine who was right because Copernicus and Aristotle actually meant different things by the sun. Uh, their theory so changed the meaning of those terms. When Aristotle said sun, he meant um, an immaterial crystalline orb that was moved by uh, the harmony of the spheres uh, and the mathematical proportion of the reality to move on its own around the center of the universe in imitation of God's motion. Whereas Copernicus, and later Galileo and Newton, would say um, it's uh, a hunk of matter, uh, basically a hunk of rock, uh, sitting in the middle of the solar system and attracting all the objects in it to its own uh, gravitational pull and in turn being pulled by the gravitation of the galaxy surrounding it. Uh, so it was like talking of apples and oranges. They were literally talking about different things, and you couldn't judge which one was more correct than the other. Uh, so we're going to look at these two arguments by Wittgenstein uh, and Quine. Uh, that uh, Both of them involve this network theory of meaning, um, that the word dog is connected with a whole series of other terms, um, and those terms in turn are connected to a whole series of other terms uh, and those are connected to a series of practices or, or plays in a game or rules for how you ought to act in relationship to a dog or a cow or a piece of meat uh, or a person or an animal so that when one part of the network changes or the entire network changes as in a paradigm or a theory change there's sort of a ripple effect uh, so when a scientist discovers that animals are not innate essences the way Aristotle thought, but are mechanisms with a pumping heart um, and brains that operate by electrochemical signals, uh, all of the meanings of dog and cow and meat and person, all of those things would change. Um, and one of Wittgenstein's important ideas was that the way in which the meanings of things were interrelated meant that there wasn't a simple relationship between language and the world. You might think that the word chair, for example, has a simple definition, and it's a very clear matter whether you're looking at a chair or not. Um, but um, Kuhn got his idea that part of a paradigm is learning to recognize what's a chair and what isn't a chair, and that different paradigms might come to have very different ideas of what a chair is. Um, so you can see that different, there may be a common idea of a chair, but there are all kinds of different examples of a chair which don't share any elements in common, uh, which nonetheless are chair in different ways. Just as if you look at all the members of a family, there wouldn't be any one set of properties that they all share in common, um, yet they do bear some family resemblance. So, Quine's famous argument about this was that um, how we recognize something uh, is in fact guided by our language uh, 
So it's impossible for us to define our language or to translate our language uh, by merely pointing at the world. His famous example was a problem of radical translation. Uh, some of you may have seen the movie Arrival um, that deals with aliens who come to the planet and have the problem of trying to talk to us uh, when we share no language or concepts in common. Uh, that's Quine's problem of radical translation. Um, and that's often a problem in the medical profession, wondering whether the doctor and the nurses and the patients and patients of different cultures uh, understand your terms in the same way and how you can explain something to them uh, in their language or their way of seeing the world uh, and have some idea that they mean the same thing. Uh, Quine's famous example is um, the example of, of someone trying to teach you what the word gabagai means in their language. Uh, they would point to uh, uh, an animal, uh, the one we would call a rabbit, uh, and say gabagai, and they would say it again and again in relationship to that type of experience. Uh, you might think, because that's what our paradigm has trained us to say, is that gabagai means rabbit. Uh, but of course, they might be talking about something completely different. They might have just meant warm-blooded animal, and that's the only warm-blooded animal around. Or they might have meant you know, long-eared mammal or long ears. Uh, they might have been talking about the rabbit's coat. Um, they might have um, been just talking about mammals. Uh, they might have even, uh, if they were um, you know, shamanistic culture, they might have been talking about the spirit of the rabbit rather than the, uh, the body of the rabbit itself. Um, the problem is that there's no way of determining what the real meaning of that uh, term is because there's always too many possible uh, interpretations. Um, a paradigm solves the problem by training you to narrow down those different interpretations. But without the paradigm, uh, you wouldn't be able to narrow it down. Uh, and without the, uh, the paradigm, people in a different paradigm uh, might use that word and see different facts and therefore interpret that uh, word differently. Uh, in some ways, that's the same uh, problem that Wittgenstein was trying to get across in his famous private language argument. Um, the private language argument was an attempt to show that language was a matter of practices. Uh, sometimes Wittgenstein would say this was like rules of a game. Uh, you learn a language in the same way you learn the rules of the game. Uh, and instead of saying that um, language describes already existing facts and objects, uh, sometimes we say the rules of the game construct or constitute those objects. So when we're playing baseball, there's a certain set of rules that make something a strike or make something an out or make something safe. Uh, we pronounce uh, in weddings, I hereby um, pronounce you man and wife. Uh, those words, uh, in accordance with certain rules and practices, create those objects into being. Um, and we said before that a dog or someone had no idea of, of baseball might see something completely different. They might see someone sliding or running or hitting a spheroid, um, but they wouldn't see strikes and outs and runs and things like that because those are only part of the game. Uh, the private language argument um, really has two different types of significance. One is to show, just reinforce this first point, um, that language and thought only function in a social context in accordance with rules and practices. Uh, that's the paradigm, the disciplinary matrix that teaches you a set of practices that gives the meaning of things uh, a fixed point. Otherwise, translation would be indeterminate and incommensurable, uh, as Quine and Kuhn say, uh, or they would see different worlds. Um, the second point of the private language argument is even broader because it suggests that uh, all thought uh, and all experience of even emotion or awareness requires a language uh, which has rules of correctness in some public context. Um, so the private language argument uh, also suggests what Kuhn had said, that a paradigm and the rules uh, of language infect uh, every little bit of our reality. Uh, they determine what things we see, uh, and they even determine what feelings, what emotions we have. So let's look at the argument. Um, 
it's called the private language argument because Kuhn's attempting to show those two things. Uh, to show that all language understanding requires a set of rules, and it's the rules or practices that make the thing uh, mean what it does in a paradigm, not some fundamental already existing connection between us and the world. Uh, and secondly, to show that uh, all of our feelings and experiences, all of our thought require language. Um, the scenario is we're supposed to imagine someone on a desert island outside of all social contact, uh, and they're trying to sort of create their own private language to describe their own emotions. Uh, you may think it's fairly obvious when you describe your own feelings to someone to determine whether you're glad or confused or depressed or happy or joyful. Um, but Wittgenstein is going to say you learn to make those distinctions and you learn to make those distinctions on the basis of external shared actions that you've learned to categorize and you've learned to see just like you can learn to see the cow uh, or learn to see the duck or the rabbit uh, in a paradigm in a system of rules. So the argument is that if you're keeping a journal and trying to, to create your language you might you know keep a journal and say oh today I feel this feeling and I'll call it E. Uh, imagine it's you don't have a language yet so you're making up terms to describe your language and then you keep track of the feelings and then all of a sudden uh, say on the 17th day you say oh I have this feeling again it's the same feeling E that I had before. Uh, Wittgenstein's argument on the face of it is very simple he simply asks how do we know that our memory is reliable in that case how do you know that E is the same? Just in the same way as Quine asked, so you might assume that Gavagai means rabbit, but how do you know that it's not something else? Um, there have to be some set of, just as there had to be some set of rules or a paradigm that determined through practice uh, and sociological control of behavior uh, what it, precisely the term Gavagai applied to. So we learn what love is from associating love with hugs and smiles and caresses. Uh, and we learn the meaning of those things. If someone um, says a little child runs up to its mommy and you know, pounds her angrily on the, the knee and says, I love you, mommy, uh, we'll explain to them that they're playing the game wrong, uh, that that word love does not mean that, just as if someone thinks they should run to the left to third base first when they're playing baseball, we'll correct them and say, that's not how you play the game. Uh, so Wittgenstein's point was that uh, even understanding our own feelings and emotions requires a language, uh, and a language is a publicly shared set of rules for behavior. Uh, it happens to be behavior for communication uh, of various symbols but those symbols communicate our rules and understandings, our paradigm for how to act, how to perceive, how to feel, uh, how to make our way in the world and play the game of life according to the rules uh, that we've learned in our particular culture or paradigm. So you can watch, by clicking on the, the link there, you can watch uh, Wittgenstein's um, um, uh, story about the private language argument called the beetle in the box. Uh, if we all had a beetle in a box that and only we could look in our own box just as only we can feel our emotions or see our thoughts. Um, so um, if that were the case uh, we could talk about it and tell other people about it but the only way other people would know what we were talking about was based upon our external behavior just the way the only way a child knows what love is is by their behavior and how we enforce their behavior in accordance with certain rules. Uh, it would turn out that what was going on on the inside would be irrelevant. The actual beetle in the box and whether there was one or wasn't one would be irrelevant. So in the same way uh, Kuhn and Wittgenstein are going to say what's really out there in the world, what's really in our head uh, is beyond our paradigms, the real absolute that science aimed at was uh, irrelevant, that what mattered was the social construction of reality through rules and through paradigms, um, and that there was no way to judge a paradigm or a theory or a system of language from the outside because all of our facts and values and meanings were in fact constructed within that social reality, within the world that was constituted by that language, uh, just in the same way that nowadays a video game with all its rules and alternate views of reality and certain things that you're supposed to do in certain situations uh, is a separate little virtual reality with its own rules. 
Uh, in some ways, that's what a paradigm is. Uh, and it's not the absolute reality that science gets at. It's the constructed social reality that you learn, and science is learning to play a game that has certain ends and goals uh, in the same way that uh, a regular game or a video game might. So you can click that and watch that uh, on your own. Uh, you should also watch um, this uh, longer clip called In My Language, which was a popular or a viral video a few years back. Um, it's a video by uh, an autistic person who wasn't capable of communicating except through a keyboard. Uh, and when they would attempt to speak uh, or act in the world before, people would think that they were mentally disabled and were incapable of thought or of intelligent action. Uh, but it was only when uh, she learned to communicate through a keyboard and talk in our language uh, that people took her seriously uh, and believed that she was intelligent and deserving of moral consideration. Um, so you may want to look at this to get uh, an idea of just how thoroughly our assumptions about language and our assumptions about uh, how we ought to act and how we interact with the world uh, are in some ways artificial and peculiar to our paradigm, peculiar to our culture and its history, um, and how people who might be playing the game of life according to different rules and speaking a different language might be completely unintelligible to us uh, and might uh, be seeing the world in a different way. Of course, in medicine, this will be a big problem since many of the people you deal with won't share your beliefs, may not share your language, may not share your history. Um, and you're going to have to attempt to communicate with them uh, in a way that bridges the gap between those different paradigms. Um, so watch that uh, video. So to summarize, uh, Kuhn thought that members of different paradigms occupy different worlds. They don't have any shared meanings, they don't have any shared facts, they don't have shared values. Um, and that's because language, again, not interpreted as just speech, but interpreted as a system of rules governing every aspect of our thought and feeling and action in the world that constitutes, like uh, baseball, constitutes the reality of strikes and balls. Um, so language is a set of rules that actually creates the objects that we perceive. We learn to create cups and chairs and trees and suns uh, and males and females um, by uh, a learning a rule of language or learning a paradigm. Uh, and there might be alternative sets of rules and paradigms uh, and the judgment between those wouldn't come from some objective Archimedean standpoint where we uh, looked at those things as scientists not involved in the object that we're studying, um, but we could only consider those truths from within the point of view of the thing we're studying, uh, only within the rules of our paradigm, and there would be no objective standpoint by which we could judge that our viewpoint was better than any other.